similar kind of thing. This video is about random coordinate descent. We have a function f from r into r that we wish to minimize. Starting from x of 0, we apply the following gradient descent update equation. x of k plus 1 is equal to x of k minus eta, the positive step size or learning rate parameter. Then in conventional gradient descent, we have the gradient vector. But here what we do is that we use the component ik, where ik is in the set from 1 to n. This is multiplied by the standard coordinate vector eik. This is a vector of size n by 1. Every component is 0 except the component in position ik. In the case iteration, the value of ik is chosen randomly from this set. Only position ik is updated using this formula. To be able to do the convergence analysis, we of course need to make assumptions regarding function f. Since we are talking about the gradient, function f is assumed to have first order partial derivatives that are continuous. We also assume that function f is convex and that the gradient vector of function f is Lipschitz continuous. Since function f is convex, for every x and y in Rn, we have this inequality satisfied. f of x is greater than or equal to f of y plus the inner product between vector x minus y and the gradient vector of function f evaluated at y. Since the gradient vector is Lipschitz continuous, there exists a positive real number L such that for every x and y, the L2 norm of the difference between the gradient vector evaluated at x and the gradient vector evaluated at y is upper bounded by the positive number L times the Euclidean distance between x and y. Using this, we now derive an inequality that is very useful in the convergence analysis. Define the function g of lambda to be f of lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y. x and y are n-dimensional vectors. Lambda is a non-negative real number in the closed interval from 0 to 1. Lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y can be written as y plus lambda x minus y. If this vector has components z1 all the way to zn, and we are interested in the derivative of function g with respect to lambda, we can apply the chain rule. The derivative with respect to lambda is a summation g from 1 to n. The gth term in the sum is the partial derivative of function f with respect to zg. And then we differentiate zg with respect to alpha. And the derivative is xg minus yg. This is an inner product between the vector x minus y and the gradient vector evaluated at lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y. Note that lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y, this is equal to x if lambda is equal to 1 and is equal to y if lambda is equal to 0. f of x minus f of y can be written as g of 1 minus g of 0, which in turn can be written as the integral lambda from 0 to 1 of the first derivative of function g with respect to lambda. Subtract and add the first derivative evaluated at 0. The first derivative evaluated at 0 is the inner product between vector x minus y and the gradient vector evaluated at y. This does not depend on lambda, so when we integrate from 0 to 1, we just get the inner product. This difference here is the inner product of x minus y and the difference between these two gradient vectors. One gradient vector is evaluated at lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y. The other is evaluated at y. The result of integrating this inner product is some real number, and any real number is upper bounded by its absolute value. And by the triangle inequality for integrals, the magnitude of the integral is less than or equal to the integral of the magnitude of the integrand. Now we have the magnitude or absolute value of the inner product, and this can be upper bounded by the cauchy schwarz inequality. Specifically, the upper bound is the L2 norm of x minus y, that's the Euclidean distance between x and y, times the L2 norm of the difference of these two gradient vectors. Now we can make use of the definition of the Lipschitz continuity of the gradient vector. It implies that this L2 norm is upper bounded by the positive number L times the L2 norm of the difference of these two quantities, lambda x plus y minus lambda y minus y. This goes away with that. Lambda is a non-negative number. We can take it outside the norm. So the upper bound is lambda L, the L2 norm of x minus y. There is another copy here, so we can square. L times the L2 norm squared can be taken outside the integral. The integral lambda from 0 to 1 of lambda is 1 half. This means that f of x minus f of y is upper bounded by this inner product plus 1 half L times the L2 norm squared of x minus y. For every x and y in Rn, we have f of x upper bounded by f of y plus the inner product between x minus y and the gradient vector evaluated at y plus 1 half times L times the square of the Euclidean distance between x and y. That's another useful inequality in addition to the inequality that we get under the assumption that f is a convex function. This is the update equation. In iteration k, we choose a number uniformly from the set from 1 to n. 
and it is this component that is updated in the x vector using the respective component in the gradient vector. We start the analysis of conversions using the inequality that has been derived under the assumption that the gradient vector of function f is Lipschitz continuous. For y and x, we use x of k and x of k plus 1. Those are the x vectors in iterations k and k plus 1. f of x k plus 1 is less than or equal to f of x k plus the inner product plus l over 2 times this l to norm squared. We can express this difference here using the update equation. x of k plus 1 minus x of k is equal to minus eta component i k in the gradient vector evaluated at x of k times vector e i k. What is the l to norm squared of this vector? We have eta squared times the square of this partial derivative e i k transpose times e i k is equal to 1. What about this part here? We have minus eta, the partial derivative, which is component i k in the gradient vector. We have the inner product between the gradient vector and e i k, which is the same as this partial derivative. We get minus eta times the square. We can combine these two terms as the square of the partial derivative multiplied by minus eta times 1 minus eta l over 2. If eta is between 0 and 1 over l, eta l over 2 is between 0 and 1 half multiplied by minus 1. We get that 0 is greater than minus eta l over 2, which is greater than or equal to minus half. Add 1 to all sides. 1 is greater than 1 minus eta l over 2, which is greater than or equal to 1 half. Multiply the three sides by minus eta. The inequalities are reversed, and we get this inequality here that minus eta times 1 minus eta l over 2 is less than or equal to minus eta over 2. We can upper bound f of x of k plus 1 by f of x of k minus eta over 2 times the square of component i k in the gradient vector evaluated at x of k. Note that we have equality here if we choose the learning rate parameter to be equal to 1 over l. Subtract f of x star from both sides and f of x star is the minimum of function f. That's the optimal value. Given x of k, let's take the expectation of both sides with respect to i k. Note that i k is uniform over the set from 1 to n. The expectation of this term is the vth component squared multiplied by 1 over n, and we sum over v from 1 to n. We fix x of k and take the expectation with respect to i k. This part here becomes 1 over n times the L to norm squared of the gradient vector evaluated at x of k. Note that when we take this expectation, this term here becomes the expectation of f of x of k plus 1 given x of k. In the next step, we take the expectation with respect to x of k. We need to take the expectation of this L to norm squared. From here, we get the expectation of f of x of k. Now we have the expectation with respect to x of k of the expectation of f of x of k plus 1 given x of k. By iterated expectations, this is exactly the expectation of f of x of k plus 1. I treated expectations or the law of total expectation or the tower rule states that if we have random variables a and b, the expectation of a is equal to the expectation over b of the conditional expectation of a given b, assuming finite expectations. Recall that if h is a convex function and a is a random variable, then h of the expectation of a is less than or equal to the expectation of h of a, multiplying by minus 1 we have minus the expectation of h of a is less than or equal to minus h the expectation of a. In our case here, the random variable a is the L to norm, and the convex function is the square. Minus eta over 2n expectation of the L to norm squared of the gradient vector is upper bounded by minus eta over 2n the expectation of the L to norm squared. Let's denote the expectation of the L to norm of the gradient vector of function f evaluated at x of k by epsilon. So this here is epsilon squared. Let's also define phi of k to be the expectation of f of x of k minus f of x star. The inequality that we have obtained after taking the expectation with respect to i k given x k and then taking the expectation with respect to x k is phi of k plus 1 is less than or equal to phi of k minus eta over 2n epsilon squared. From the previous page, if this is epsilon and this is phi of k, what we have from here is phi of k plus 1 is less than or equal to phi of k minus theta over 2n epsilon squared, which means that phi of k minus phi of k plus 1 is greater than or equal to eta over 2n epsilon squared. 
which is greater than or equal to zero. The sequence for all k is not increasing. If this quantity is strictly positive, then the sequence is strictly decreasing. Because function f with domain rn is assumed to be convex, then for every x and y in rn, we have that f of x is greater than or equal to f of y plus the inner product between x minus y and the gradient vector evaluated at y. For x, let's use x star. That's an x vector at which f is minimum. For y, let's use x of k. f of x star is greater than or equal to f of x of k plus the inner product of x star minus x of k and the gradient vector evaluated at x of k. Move this to the right-hand side and move this to the left-hand side. We get that f of x of k minus f of x star is less than or equal to this inner product multiplied by minus 1. I write it as the inner product of the gradient vector and the vector x of k minus x star. This is a real number that is upper bounded by its absolute value. Applying the Cauchy's Schwartz inequality, we have an upper bound, which is the L2 norm of the gradient vector evaluated at x of k times the Euclidean distance between x of k and x star. Let's make this important assumption that for every non-negative integer k, the distance between x of k and x star is bounded by this positive real number, R0. If we take the expectation of both sides with respect to x of k, the left-hand side becomes phi of k, and the right-hand side becomes R of 0 times epsilon. Then phi of k squared is less than or equal to R0 squared times epsilon squared. Taking the reciprocal of both sides, we get that 1 over phi k squared is greater than or equal to 1 over R0 squared epsilon squared. Note that epsi itself depends on k because it is the expected value of the L2 norm of the gradient vector evaluated at x of k. The good news is that when we use both our inequalities, epsi will go away. We have this inequality here, and previously we got that 5 of k minus 5 of k plus 1 is greater than or equal to eta over 2n epsi squared. Multiplying, we get that 5 k minus 5 k plus 1 over 5 k squared is greater than or equal to eta over 2n r0 squared. We know that 5k is greater than or equal to 5k plus 1. Then 1 over 5k is less than or equal to 1 over 5k plus 1. If we multiply both sides by 1 over 5k, we get that 1 over 5k squared is upper bounded by 1 over 5k times 5k plus 1. Now this right-hand side can be written as 1 over 5k plus 1 minus 1 over 5k. Let's sum both sides from 0 to m minus 1. On the left-hand side, we get this constant multiplied by m. On the right-hand side, we get 1 over phi 1 minus 1 over phi 0 plus 1 over phi 2 minus 1 over phi 1 plus 1 over phi 3 minus 1 over phi 2 and so on. As we can see, we have a telescopic sum. The only surviving terms are minus 1 over phi of 0 and when the index k is equal to m minus 1, we get 1 over phi m. This difference is upper bounded by 1 over phi m. Rearranging the terms, we get that phi m, which is the expectation of f of x m, minus the minimum value of function f, f of x star, is upper bounded by 2n r0 squared over eta m. n is the number of optimization variables. It's the dimensionality of vector x. r0 comes from this assumption. We assume that at every iteration, the vector x that we have has a Euclidean distance from x star that is less than or equal to r0. In the denominator, we have eta, the learning rate. Eta is less than or equal to 1 over L. The maximum value that we can use for eta is 1 over L. And then we have this M, which is the iteration index. This difference here is upper bounded by a positive number divided by M. This upper bound tends to 0 as M tends to infinity. 